This portion of code review is on the residential provisions of the 2015 International Energy Conservation Code, IECC. So why care about the IECC? Energy codes and standards set minimum fishery efficiency requirements for new renovated buildings, assuring reductions in energy use and emissions over the life of the building. Energy codes are a subset of building codes which establish baseline requirements and govern building construction. And here's a little bit about the family of I codes. The IECC is one of the international codes. This code establishes minimum regulations for energy efficient buildings using prescriptive and performance related provisions. The IECC contains energy provisions for both residential and commercial buildings. It focuses on the building envelope, facades, on air sealing, minimum insulation levels, and efficient glazing. And for mechanical sim addresses equipment efficiency, HVAC controls, and heating and cooling distribution. And for electrical systems, it focuses on interior and exterior lighting, wattage, and the controls for efficient lighting usage. So what is the relationship between the IRC and the IECC? Well, the IECC addresses only energy, and the IRC does address all topics. It also has Chapter 11, which covers energy efficiency. Up to now, that's been out by the mass code. That Chen opted in, opted for all of the CC book, and we don't have much to look at there. In 2015, though, the IECC consolidated the IRC energy chapter, so it remains how Massachusetts will just simply handle that that chapter in the new IRC books when when they do establish the 2015. For now, we are only establishing the 2015 IECC, so it makes it a little simple. We don't have to, if as long as we're using the 2009 uh, IRC, we will not have to look at that chapter, I believe. It'll still be up. So let's take a look at the structures. This is a new structure. If you're familiar with the old IECC, which is a mass uh, CSL, I'm sure you are, uh, you just, you're just going to notice here the new thing is Chapter 5 for existing buildings. And existing buildings were not addressed almost hardly, uh, not, not at all dressed, addressed by the code books beforehand uh, and even by the mass code because they simply took the IECC uh, chapter on existing buildings and told, told us not to take a look, not even not to use that, covered the, IE, uh, the existing buildings portion. Uh, so now we're going to have a whole section in the IECC that'll just focus on the, um, on all of the different provisions for the energy so it'll be interesting to see what's going on there but for now we'll be using that chapter here and consider it new and put into the uh, put into the code so what's the scope anyway the scope of the IECC as far as the residential portion is concerned is considered the one and two family dwellings and the townhouses which have always been a gray area uh, it says here townhouses of any size but there, there's a lot of ambiguity there. Uh, that, that's part of, partially found in the other code books. For now, we'll just focus here and consider it the, being covered under the IECC. And of course, you have the R2, R3, and R4 groups, which are the residential, uh, the use groups, of course, that are laid out. If you need more information on that, look at the uh, look at the IBC. I believe it's Chapter Three, Use and Occupancy, to get a clarification of what those groups are because it's not really explained in the IECC. So again there's the story restriction which are less than or equal to uh, three stories is the general rule of thumb. There are, I hear in Massachusetts there are going to be some provisions for uh, for the four story item because we do have a, a lot of four deckers that are uh, residential so let's see how that turns out and I might be able to address that later on in another presentation that will be part of this uh, code update. So the all buildings that are not uh, called residential, the, all of us are defined as commercial. So remember the multi uh, the multifamily homes that have like uh, you're talking about condos and all that. Even though they're all residences within, they they are uh, 
they were often con they are mostly considered to be commercial buildings and treated that way because of the uh, the the one and two family you exceed the two family recommendation there or requirement and that goes without saying and a lot of times well anything that exceeds definitely the three stories for now we're going to treat as a commercial building so what's again the scope uh, what do you do with mixed occupancies and that's of course where you have maybe a restaurant down below and on the first story of a car maybe an apartment building and then the uh, the, the rest is residences so you treat the residential occupancy under the residential code, just as we did in the past, and you treat the commercial occupancy under the commercial code. So there you're allowed to divide the two. But if, of course, as always, a code official has a final authority. It's probably best to check with the uh, the inspector first, or the city, the, uh, that you, the town that you're working in. And let's take a look at the scope in another slide here. So a bit on the scope, uh, this is found in section R102.1, uh, Alternative Methods, Design and Methods of Construction and Equipment. So I'll read it off as it says, but just to backtrack a little bit, in the IECC, the R number before, uh, letter before, always means the residential portion. Remember, the book is divided into two. It's all in the same book. Uh, and one half of the book is commercial, begins, all those begin with the C letter beforehand so it, uh, the commercial item on this would be C102 let's just say so another thing too the, to look at in the numbers there 102 the 1 means chapter 1 so you always know what chapter you're referring to just by the the call numbers I call it the uh, by that R102.1 so this is a cover themselves type thing they put in the book uh, the code is not intended to prevent installation of any material or prohibit design or method of construction that is not specifically prescribed in this code. And such equipment, material, or design shall be approved by the code official. Uh, that's just what you find there. That I don't believe that's also new. Uh, however, it's just something that we always uh, look at here is their, their little statements and disclaimers. So scope uh, is concerned to construction documents. Uh, that's in section 103. If you have your book handy with you and open by any chance, if not, you can always download these uh, slides and take a look at that at a later time if you want to look it up. Because this at the top of the slide will always be where where we're referring to in the book itself, which kind of makes it easy to follow along. So documentation shall be provided by a registered design professional where required. An electric meteor can be used. And that's that's good, and that is new. Information required, and it shows you within that uh, that that you are going to need for the construction documents at a minimum, is insulation materials and R values, fenestration U factors and SHGC, area weighted U factor and SHGC calculations, mechanical SWH the the service hot water, uh, water heating even uh, equipment types sizes and efficiencies, equipment and system controls, duct sealing and pipe insulation and location, and the air sealing details. So duct sealing was in always in the past and a few others, the fenestration, U factors and SHGC. SHGC of course meaning solar heat gain coefficient. And those are, uh, if you look at your window labels, labels are, uh, the windows should be labeled or well, you should be able to obtain cut sheets from the manufacturer of the windows that see what the SHGC are and the, those values. It's almost like uh, the R, uh, the R uh, values that you would always find on insulation. It tells a little bit about how much solar heat gain is, what's going on with the window itself. So how much solar coming through the window and warming the interior. So again, a little bit more here on scope with... The, these are found all in sections R104 through R109. Again, those are more of the what I consider the administrative sections. Uh, you can see inspections here in 104, 104, R104. Code validity, uh, reference codes and standards are found in R106. So that that's always good to take a look at. And because cons they're considered part of the requirements of the code, but the IECC tells you right there that they, they take precedence. It's another one of those they cover themselves type statements. Uh, a little bit about fees, but 
uh, must be paid pay before permit is issued, it says. Uh, we'll have to be referring to the mass codes on that more. The stop work order, uh, that's, that is also tweaked a bit by mass code and the uh, Board of Appeals, all those items. Most of the administration administrative items, you really got to look at where the mass code may uh, trump the, the, actually trump what the IECC is saying. It'll modify, and of course we we go by the mass code always uh, it ex is the one that we use when it exceeds any of the requirements that are in the IECC. So inspections, uh, construction work for a permit is required. I'm just reading it right from the requirement there. It's subject to inspection by the code official or a designated a agent. Uh, now, why do they say that designated agent? Because uh, a lot of the inspection on, in the IEC is done by the third party raiders or HERS raider. So they're kind of, you can figure them in the mix. And where are the required inspections? Of course, uh, I think they're just doing something that we all know about the footing and foundation, framing rough in plumbing rough and mechanical rough and, and and the final one thing about the mechanical uh, I believe that you're still allowed to do as you were before you can do the duct sealing test either at rough in or final uh, though they are given two different time frames when you can do that but we'll see if that shows up a little later in the presentation so some more reference codes and standards and the, uh, the codes and standards listed in the chapter are considered part of the requirements of the code, prescribed uh, extent of each such reference, and as further regulated in sections 106.1.1 and 106.2. And the, the funny, they get into this whole thing about conflicts, and you could almost read down the list here. It's funny uh, that they, uh, they, they're actually conflicting in what they mean, because here they go on to say where differences occur between this code and the reference codes and standards provisions of this code apply and a little further down you see where the extent of the reference to a reference code is standard and includes subject matter that is within the scope of this code the provisions of this code as applicable shall take precedence over the provisions in the reference code as standard uh, it's kind of a little bit of a conflict in the statements there I think you can find that so one thing, let's go to the real meat of the item, and that's the where, this certificate. It's always been posted on a wall in the space where the furnace is located, uh, or a utility room, or an approved location inside the building. Uh, the, now that's the certificate, but it was always said to be place the certificate at the electrical box was the one place that you did it before. Now I think they've expanded that a little bit more here. Uh, I'd still go, still place all my items right there at the electrical box as the original requires so the, but this is a per what's called a permanent certificate and this certificate shall be completed by the builder or registered design professional again and it should list the R values and insulation for the building envelope the U factors the SHGC and fenestration uh, the service water heating equipment and uh, the building envelope air leakage testing so I'm going to take a look at that and give you a bullet point list here in the next slide. So here it looks like uh, that it should include all of these. Uh, again, you can get a handout or a copy of the these uh, the presentation, or if you have a moment to jot it down, or uh, either way, look it up just simply at R R four one point three if you need that list of to know what has to go in the certificate. So the certificate lists uh, just a little few things. The gas-fired unvented room heater, electric furnace, or baseboard electric heater, rather than listing an efficiency for those heating types. So you just simply fill it in with, uh, if you have one of those type of heating systems, which are older, there's no, no, not really a way to gauge the efficiency. Now remember the efficiency values, like the SEER, S-E-E-R values for air conditioners, you can look those up. That for different heating and cooling equipment, there are uh, there are items that where the the equipment's been tested, and it ends up achieving a certain energy rating, and that's uh, that's why. But they, they haven't been done for these older pieces of equipment. Okay, so let's take a look at the overview of the structure and what these uh, different where these requirements, how they're broken down a little bit and where they apply. But just to say, there's climate specific requirements. 
Remember, you always use that map for the climate zones. In Massachusetts, we're in climate zone 5 here. And there are mandatory envelope requirements. So the design must meet these requirements regardless of location, which include moisture and infiltration control and duct insulation. Other envelope requirements, such as insulation values and window efficiency, are based on the climate of the project location. So there, there's how you could divide the two. And there are many others uh, not mentioned here, of course, in the mandatory requirements in this little bullet point list. But mechanical ventilation, systems serving multiple dwelling units, snow melt and ice system controls, pools and spas are all other parts of the code that we'll take a look at a little bit later in the presentation and touch on uh, pretty much all of these. So they're, they're not listed right here, but look at them in the upcoming. A little review on uh, if you happen not be not familiar with the previous uh, code in the IECC. It, there's the prescriptive measures and the mandatory. And you first have to pretty much figure the difference between the two. Mandatory again, you can't be they can't be traded down. Now the thing about prescriptive is prescriptive items are allowed their trade-offs. You can uh, let's say if you've done your roof insulation and you under insulated, say the code in your area says you need an R forty six, for example or for some reason it says in the IECC and you only put in the R38 well nobody's gonna make you rip out all that insulation uh, you don't have to I mean in, in the old days yeah a lot of times you were you had to just redo everything so here they'll give you a trade-off and let's say you can have that traded off to using more energy efficient windows so you would have to be above the minimum required by the code and there, there you can make a trade-off and you compensate for other improve. That's where it means by compensating for other improvements elsewhere. Uh, but the there there are hard limits, what they call. There 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 are limits to what you could trade off. Sometimes, uh, if you were let's say you put R20 in the attic, uh, and you were thinking you might be able to trade that off for more energy efficient windows. No, it's not going to work. You if you're way down too far below the minimum of what's required, they're not going to let you do it. So that's that's pretty much how that works. Okay, here's the zone map, of course. We're in zone 5 in the green. That's the, th the thing to remember. And uh, th it's, uh, the, all the temperature zones are defined here and different, as you can see. So another overview here for the residential code requirements. And for the residential, the focus is really on the building envelope. Uh, first and foremost, but I'll also say equal to the other items we'll go to, which are the ducts, the limited space the heating, the idea, no, the the. But remember, there are no appliance requirements here, and the the lighting equipment efficiency is still 75 percent of all lamps to be high efficacy, as they call it, which to me is another way of just saying high efficiency, uh, and the you know 75 percent of the lighting fixtures are to have only, or at least that the fixtures are to have only high efficacy lamps meaning CFLs, LEDs and uh, the, 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 high, the high performing type of uh, lighting the light bulbs I'll even say, they're not even bulbs anymore but they, they're, uh, of course they use much less energy is the idea and that's what they're talking about and that's why I say LEDs or CFLs or even the T8 Fluorescent fixtures are, are in as far as that's concerned. Okay, so let's look at uh, how you have your four options generally. for You can look at it that way for IECC compliance. And you have the prescriptive method, the R value, no trade-offs though. You have the prescriptive method with the U factor and trade-offs within individual components and some UA trade-offs between components. Simulated performance which uh, also has a simulated performance alternative. You can find that laid out in R405 there, that section. Now, and now a new thing that's in is the Energy Rating Index, ERI, a compliance alternative found in R406. So the uh, prescriptive UA trade-offs are generally found in ResCheck. Uh, it's a uh, computer software. It's RES Check. As far as spelt out that way, RES is the acronym. Uh, you also have the simulated performance, which 
it can be used in a few other ones, uh, different software programs. One is called REM rate, R-E-M rate, and then energy gauge, all one word as it is for their their advertising, and REM design, R-E-M design. And for ERI mostly, the one that's being used is the uh, REM rate. So that gives you an idea of the software. Now the good thing about the pre prescriptive way of doing it in the R value, that's the second category, you don't need any software. So let's take a look at some of the building envelope specific requirements. And most IECC requirements for residential buildings are for building thermal envelope as highlighted in the orange in the diagram. That is your building envelope. Uh, you can see it's not the same. It, it That's all your, in, your insulation barrier. I like to think this area the condition space is being is being confined within uh like air confined within a balloon and the balloon is the envelope and that envelope is called a continuous envelope because it has the idea is not to have any penetrations or areas where energy can be uh leaked out let's say so you're going to have uh, air infiltration barriers there you're going to have moisture barriers around that envelope uh the, but you can see too the the, 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 that, that, that's, uh, the moisture barrier may also look at the attic area on the top left. That may extend a little differently, but no matter what, it's still within the confines of the entire home, the building envelope. So, again, the fenestration is a term used by architects. It means all the glazing, the windows, uh, for anybody that's not familiar with that. It, it's going to include, the envelope includes the ceilings, walls, you have that two different recommendations there, above and below grade, and mass walls. Well, above and below grade are treated differently. That's why they're bullet pointed there. And for a mass wall, a mass wall, if you're not familiar with that, think of it as a massive wall is what I like to think of. Now, the idea behind that is that's, that could be a boulder. It could be a piece of timber. You would have to, if you really need the definition on mass walls, you can also find it in the IRC books. And the, what they are is they're, they're designed... They should always be above grade for number one, the mass walls. The idea is they're like a giant boulder. They might place under the foundation. Let's say you have a raised uh, area of the foundation on piers uh, somehow or on, uh, on some type of columns. The idea behind that is that massive piece takes in radiant heat. So it definitely placed mostly, it depends on what orientation, but mostly placed on a southern exposure. So in the winter, that large structure, whether and it can also be a chunk of concrete, is uh, gaining, getting heated up by the sun's heat, and the idea is it'll dissipate it into the home at a later time at night when the sun goes down, and that's the idea of the uh, the mass wall. You can look a little bit more on that just to break it down. So, but you have some exceptions. Oh yeah, the, let me go back to the floors, slabs, and crawl spaces are considered part of the envelope. Crawl spaces are now treated very differently. If you're not familiar with the previous code, about they're also broken into two categories, which are uh, vented or unvented types. So, what are your exceptions? Uh, the low energy use, uh, less than 3.5 BTU square foot, or the less uh, the one watt per square foot or other floor area, or unconditioned spaces. So, there's your exceptions. And here's a chart. Here's what it looks like, right from the IECC book. The uh, this this table's right from there. The the table listed uh, number at the top. So it's this is referred to as the R value table. But note that there are some well, more R values in ta in in the table. Uh, and there are also well, I say R values because it, this is one good chart that has U factors and SHGC. Uh, and the climate zone seven is combined two into the table which we don't get into that's much further much further north uh, so just note that the table has footnotes that you have to really look at read the read through the footnotes they're important they have a lot of different caveats included there so new to the code is this tropical zone which has no not much of a, a basis here for for Massachusetts but uh, you could just take a look at some of the requ uh, some of the ideas here because it, it does say anything that uh, at elevation less than 2,400 feet 
and you kind of wonder uh that's pretty that's a pretty broad statement there to call it a tropical zone again a little bit more about the tropical zone and a few different requirements here so what about fenestration? We're looking. Let's t start with our list as we saw it on the slide previous about the uh, what is fenestration. I first laid that out there, and the, the main thing is the door and windows has, have to have an NFRC rating, which is the guess what the National Fenestration Rating Council, I believe it's Council uh, rating or default table, and of course they're what's called the reference standard. Uh, for doors and windows, uh, of course, there's other items too, such as the frame and all that might be rated by ASTM or another reference standard. Remember, there is a chapter on reference standards itself in the IECC, and uh, that's commonly an item that you have to look at: is who is the rating people for it. So, if now you have what's called these default tables that are made for the made by the NFRC. I'll tell you the default table already. You use that in the absence of, let's say your windows came and didn't have the labels, or you couldn't find the cut sheet from the manufacturer uh, for some reason for the SHGC and U factor. Well, then you're allowed to use what are called default tables. The problem with the default tables is they you take a big hit. You may have a triple glazed window, and just because you don't have the uh, the correct documentation, you're going to use a default table because maybe you've already installed it and you're going to live with those windows and uh, use them in your calculations but you're going to get a really poor rating low, the lowest of the low you, uh, that's what happens when you use the default uh, you just they're going to assume that it's the, the, the crummiest window out there as far as the U-factors and SHGC uh, one thing here you have no glass area limits which is good uh, uh, I think previously we did have some glass area limits, which remember the more glass work, the more glazing in a in a, any structure. That means the, uh, you're not really getting. It's not like the uh, envelope of a, uh, a a wall with cavities and insulation. Fenestration never gets a good uh, good rating for for being a thermal thermal barrier, uh, keeping out the uh, cold or keeping out the heat. So that's why. Uh, they, they used to have glass area limits because they didn't want you having so much glazing that you were actually l losing a lot of energy. But there are some exemptions, and then that's up to 15 squared feet of glazing per dwelling unit, as you see. And that you can find that in section uh, 402.3. Uh, that's where you have uh, you have that item that you have on. You can allow that 15 square feet or on one-sided hinged opaque door assemblies up to 24 square feet. You uh, you have some exemptions there found in R402.3. So the exemptions, uh, just to say they do not apply to 402.1.4 and 402.1.5. And if the only thing left is R402.1.3, it's, uh, it's something that's called an our value computation. So a little bit about the skylights, and they have to meet the U and U factor and SHGC requirements, of course. But those are different from other fenestration requirements. The, those for skylights, and uh, maybe should point the we should point that out. The, uh, the but if you look at footnote B on the table of R four hundred two point one point two. The fenestration U factor does exclude skylights, and there is a uh, standalone skylights U factor column, and the SHGC column applies to all fenestration, but exception for skylights is they may be excluded from the glazed fenestration SHGC requirements in climate zones one through three, if the SHGC does not exceed 0 0.30. So there's that caveat there, but of course that doesn't really. That, that that last item doesn't so much affect us. So here's an item about the the uh, the, the trade-offs here and that that can be used to uh, some of the ideas that can be used and the one of them is the area weighted average. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about that. So let's say if the requirement is 0.5 for the for the uh, area weighted average, 
you could either have all windows be 0.5 or you could have half of them be 0.6 and half of them be 0.4 of course that would average out to 0.5 and then you'd be in compliance so you get a little bit of uh, flexibility there but to find the if you have a let's say a mix of uh, different uh, windows with different averages so let's say the way to do this and calculate it is to multiply each windows u factor by its particular area sum up all the products divide by the total glazing area and that would give you the you'll get an area weighted average u factor and that that's the, that's the calculation so you can use different windows uh in different places that might be advantageous for uh for orientation you might not need uh something with as high a SHGC value, let's say, on a northern, in a northern uh, placed uh, wall where the glazing is being put in. So what's new is uh, what's called dynamic glazing, and it's a ratio of higher to lower labeled uh, SHGC, meaning less than or equal to 2.4. It's automatically controlled to modulate the amount of solar gain into space in multiple steps. And it shall be considered separately from other fenestration, uh, the dynamic glazing, that is. And the exception is when it's not required to comply with both high and low rated SHGC. So let's talk a little bit more about what is dynamic glazing. So again, how do we define uh, what is dynamic glazing? And it's any fenestration product that has fully reverse, the fully reversible ability to change its performance properties including U-factor, solar heat gain coefficient, or visible transmittance. That, that's the last one, VT, we haven't discussed. And the, the, this variation of performance properties, though, can be useful in addressing conflicts, let's say, for example, between the, the desire for views of the outdoors and the desire for the reduction in solar gain. So there are two main types of dy dynamic glazing. Why do I bring up that fact of uh, reducing the views of the outdoors? Because the one of them is the internal shading systems and of course when you to get more performance let less sun in you end up blocking out the view so there's, there's a little bit of a trade-off there and then the other one are called switchable glazing products so that's how both of them are uh, figured to be called and the switchable glazing products they're pretty much a electrochromic glaze system or glass system that can be tinted or untinted like I say with the tinted glasses and in response to an electrical signal or environmental change. So they can, they can actually detect a temperature change uh, and, uh, as well uh, for, the, uh, for the exterior and decide you, they could be calibrated that way to, uh, to, to create more tinting. So let's figure the temperature goes above 90 degrees and they automatically start to tint. So it can be also temperature related. So as we move on here, we'll take a look at ceilings now leave the fenestration section behind. So here's something, if you're not familiar with this, it's, it's definitely new, uh, will be new to you. Uh, it, it's the, but if you've done the, any of the IECC items in the last 2009 edition, this, is, this stays the same where you have these markers that have to be put in for the blown in insulation. So it looks like a bunch of rulers, somebody goes up in the attic, they see a bunch of rulers sticking out of the uh, Insulation. They kind of wonder what the heck's that for. Well, the, the they they are so I, there was so much fraud going on with the blown-in insulation. People not putting in the full amount. Not really. Uh, you know, they they're, they're just saying what the depth is uh, without even really being accurate. That was what was found. So now they have to put in these markers to prove it, and they have to put in every 300 square feet. They also have to uh, have a certificate that's put in at the on the at the uh, entry to the attic on the side on a, uh, as the think of those pull down stairs maybe where you'd have to put it right there on the right there on the side so that it can be easily visible and they also have to put additional uh, certificates on the on the rafters so that, that at least this way you can go up in the attic and see and also see if there's different depths because you can imagine. Uh, maybe in a ceiling that uh, where for some reason it might be might, might go up and down or uh, in height in the in the rooms and so the 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 depths might not be as much accurate as they should be 
maybe a vaulted ceiling type thing. So here, here it is, and this is what you're going to have. And there it is, what the certificate should include. The R value of the installed thickness. Now, that uh, the in, in, initial installed thickness, the installed density, the settled density, and the settled R value, the coverage area, and the number of tags installed. And I, I would have to say that this should also be put on the electrical panel. Some of this information will go over there too as well. So there's your requirements. So the ceiling though, the requirement, other requirements are based on assembly type, continuous insulation or insulation of the framing cavity. Those three things are where they all differ. And the idea is that you must meet or exceed the R values posted in the IECC. I think some of the Massachusetts stretch rules do exceed that amount. So you, wouldn't, you shouldn't have a problem there. <clears throat> How about ceilings with attics? Here's, gonna, here's something uh, to, to look at, with the, especially with the blown-in insulation. In the typical type truss pattern, we don't have enough room for the height of the insulation. You can see there where it's marked insulation that the, it, it comes down on an angle like it, did, like it does with the rafters. And you probably have an attic baffle there too, holding it back, which you should have. Well, that creates a point of really an under insulated point right at the corners there where the walls meet the ceilings. Uh, there's not, you can see how the insulation can be almost left out totally there. So they've come up with an idea to, uh, to repair this, and we'll take a look at that in the next slide. <clears throat> so leaving that standard truss behind is what's called a heel truss. And again, this was also in the 2009 IECC you can see it has a raised portion in the front so it can accommodate all of that insulation and let it go right over the top of the exterior wall and that well that's the idea so they're they're a little different configuration they're also called an energy truss something to keep in mind so how about attics without spaces so R30 is allowed for up to 500 feet squared or 20% uh, total insulated attic area, whichever is less, where required insulation levels exceed R30, or design of roof ceiling assemblies does not provide sufficient amounts of space to meet higher levels. So typically a vaulted ceiling or cathedral ceiling, this would be, and if vaulted ceilings have a requirement of, uh, le let's say, greater than R30, but rafters or trusses can't accommodate that, uh, you got to remember R30 in a insulation pretty much sticks up about about 10, 12 inches. So uh, the the other way you can comply with not more than R30 is up to up to 500 square feet or 20 percent of the total insulated ceiling area, whichever is less. So you have a certain amount that you could do vaulted, and I, I guess uh, if unless you build up the rafters in a certain way. You're given a certain amount you can get away with with the R30, and uh, after that, then you would have to do something totally different. So if you have a small vaulted ceiling over the entryway, because uh, figure 500 square feet is not a, not a heck of a lot, uh, it is relatively small. The framing members above, and you're in the uh, north with the R38 is required. Code will allow R30, so so don't so you don't have to redesign the structure just to accommodate R38 as long as the area again is less than 500 square feet or 20 percent of the ceiling area. So about the eave baffles and those are for, per, for air permeable insulations and vented attics a baffle should be installed and I'll, I'll argue that it must be installed uh, and adjacent to soften and eave vents of course to maintain the opening greater than or equal to the size of the vent, to extend over the top of the attic insulation, there it is to protect it, especially from falling out into the soffits and the eaves there. And it may be of any solid material; they're commonly made out of plastic. You just you could buy them. Uh, it's, it's a Home Home Depot or big box uh, type item that you can get almost anywhere. And here is the uh, here's a little bit of a picture of what it looks like with no baffles and some of the ridge top vents just to see the area that we're talking about there with no baffles you can see it's it's all curled up at the end there and that's not there it is too you don't have a energy truss that area has always been a little pinch spot 
so what about steel frame ceilings? They call they tend to call everything steel steel frame is uh, their word for steel studs. Cold form steel also means generally steel studs. Uh, the regular type. So if you're using metal or metal studs as we call them, uh, if, as you're using metal studs, you have a little bit different recommendation here. And just to say, when you're using this chart, you'll see that RX plus RY. So it means RX is the cavity insulation and RY is the continuous insulation. So the the Attica let's let's try to look at that. the cavity insulation yeah that's what goes between the rafters or the studs or the joists or whatever wherever it is and it's only effective up to the uh, to the width or the what's ever allowed in that cavity so if you're using two by sixes or two by eights two by tens you can't just stuff more insulation as you know compressed insulation has no value you have to and again certain insulations have certain widths like the R19 should be has to be in at least what a two by six type cavity. So the only way to get up to these higher values that they're asking for the R30s, 38s, uh, is to add in what's called a continuous insulation, and they want they want that continuous insulation. So you can think of the zip systems on the exterior of the homes. Maybe uh, I know you wouldn't use that on a steel frame ceiling, uh, but you may have to be putting uh, you may be putting poly polyurethane sheets somehow down the uh, the rigid foam uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it but uh, that just goes on to say you have to still achieve those values that they're asking for and that's why they say like you see in the top column R30 or R30A or R30 plus 3 being a rigid or or 20 use 26 plus 5 for rigid insulation that would be one example okay what about attic Hatches and doors. So the attic hatches and doors are need to be insulated as well and weather stripped. There's only one exception, the vertical doors that provide access, meaning pretty much if you have a stairway going up to your attic space. Most people of course mostly you see the uh some type of an access panel or a pull down stairway is pretty much uh pretty much more common. Uh, so a little, little bit of ideas here. Uh and this, by the way, just happens to say it goes to crawl spaces as well. If you could see that a uh, little bit, under conditions, an unconditioned space is a crawl space. But if you have a door going, trap door going to the crawl space, same thing, weather stripped and insulated. And uh, like it says, to install a wood frame or equivalent baffle or retainer when loose fill insulation is installed, that around the door, you see that to the right. So you have to come up with a system so that it doesn't. You can't just be expecting the homeowner to replace it each time on the uh, on the door or the uh, the access door going to the attic. And of course, if the pull down type, you have to come up with a system that keeps it in place altogether. So let's look at the next uh, slide a little bit more. Of the envelope requirements, and we'll move to walls here. We'll get an idea of well, a few of the different little like, areas that are now used uh, for, or changed by the new IECC. So what's covered with walls in this by the IECC? Well, remember, walls are not just, it's not just the full 8-foot high wall, but it's all the above-grade walls as defined. The attic knee walls, as you see, if you see uh, we'll go back to that photo in a minute to see why that why that comes into play. The skylight shaft walls, now that's important because there's a lot of skylight shafts that go up through the roof. Those are considered walls. They're treated as walls. When you think about in your attic space, you have uh, some room between the you know the rafter and the uh, the ceiling joist. And you, you're using, let's say, it's more of a light tunnel. Uh, the, the, here, you if you do build a, those walls around it, they have to be insulated just like the exterior walls. Never forget the perimeter joists, of course. And here's a little bit more of the walls covered. Even this, they will talk about the basement walls and the garage walls that are shared with a conditioned space, of course. So here it is in visual form about the uh, the, the insulation. Those yellow lines, of course, are the insulated areas, uh, telling you not to forget about the rim joists there. 
Uh, and insulation should not be compressed, of course, behind the wiring or plumbing because this reduces the R value of the insulation. Again, compressed insulation loses its value. It has to be to the thickness that it attains when it comes out of the roll or, or the bats by themselves. Be, you know, be sure the size of the insulation is fill the entire cavity. Bats that are uh, cut too short obviously leave voids. So for continuous insulation, make sure there are no voids and the insulation is well boarded uh, to the outside framing or well bonded to the outside framing would be a better way of putting it. And the perimeter joists between floors must be insulated. Uh, one exclusion if an 8 foot wall, uh, one example of an 8 foot wall becomes a 9 foot wall uh, because of that rim joist. So think of it all as wall. Uh, and while not a requirement, in some climates it is important to insulate exterior corners and or in the uh, headers over doors and windows to eliminate, again, transfer heat through the surfaces. And you may find that in the stretch code. Okay, here's how it looks in the chart. This is right from the table, rather, uh, if you want to call it that way, the 402.1.2. About the wood frame walls, how, you, how it would look. Look at the climate, lower climate zones we're not concerned with, but they use R13. Let's go right to our category. If you look on the far left-hand side, climate zone 5 and marine 4. And you, you have those, the fenestration numbers. Let's go to the far right. And you're allowed to use 20 or R13 plus 5. And uh, the H is a one of the subscripts there, the footnotes. They have it here on the we have it here on the slide, but there's quite a few footnotes. So again, here here's the thing: twenty. You see, you're never going to be able to achieve R twenty by using just cavity insulation because it only comes in R nineteen. Uh, so you are going to have another type of insulation barrier. Now. It's true that they've achieved, they figured all everything within the wall assembly. That's interior finish to exterior finish. So even drywall, the drywall side, the interior finish, all the way as a uh, R factor, I believe it or not, and that's now figured that way. But it's not enough to achieve the R20. And even the OSB, if you're outside sheathing, and then maybe uh, tar paper or Tyvek, and then a vinyl siding. Well, that, they have a few more points for R value, but they don't get to that R20. So that's why you see the zip system uh, being put, something like that being used. Or if not, you have to do the OSB and have a you know poly ISO half inch maybe um, board go over it, any kind of board insulation, and that, you know tape the seams and everything else to make it continuous without any area for air infiltration and that's the idea now there's a lot of ways to do this there's a lot of ways to achieve it the funny part is having to achieve that number of R20 and they've upped the game there so that you have to uh, you have to do one of those different systems uh, th this is still a carryover from the 2009 IRC so uh, oh, and the IECC So walls uh, insulated siding here. The R value labeled on the product might be use a, might be able to use an insulated siding. That's the idea. Should be listed on the certification. You have to put in the installer date and signature, and then post all that in a conspicuous location. Usually the electrical box, of course. How much can you fit in there? You say because the where the electrical panel is. Uh, that that is true. Uh, the, 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 there's going to be a lot of paperwork in that area. It looks like more and more something to keep in mind. Might design it to be a uh, in a box itself, more like a commercial uh, setting. That it's it's got it's not just a panel to the to the to the wall. That you're never going to get this all uh, all this information in the panel in in the panel and wouldn't put it there. You're not going to have it all taped on to the electrical panel. So maybe a consideration there. Uh, and the thermal resistance or R value has to be posted in there too and of course that's uh, with a reference standard ASTM C 1363 so what about steel frame walls because it it does change a bit and metal framing provides a more effective path for heat 
transmission than wood studs or uh, con construction. Uh, that goes up without saying, and because of that, things are going to change a little bit here. And you know, remember, a stud is actually uh, the wood has a pretty good R value, but uh, metal studs they simply convey they convey a lot of the uh, heat transfer or coal or, or coal transfer. They transfer the ex what's going on on the exterior side outside the envelope as far as thermal to the inside. Anybody could see that with a uh, FLIR device where they take pictures and you're able to see where you're losing your heat or the cold spots either way. So uh, the R again, the X, Y, R, X in the cavity and the Y is continuous. Uh, and in ceilings, insulation that exceeds the height of the framing must cover the framing, as they say. So steel framed uh, assemblies shall not uh, shall meet the installation insulation requirements in Table 402.2.6. That's the important takeaway here. Or they must meet the U-factor requirements in the U-factor Table 402.1.4 for frame walls and use a series parallel path calculation method. That's the main, main point to remember. So here are the mass walls. I explained a little bit about that e earlier. It can, they can be concrete uh, block con or concrete block, insulated concrete uh, or form, ICF, masonry cavity, brick other than brick veneer, <coughs> earth and solid uh, timber or logs. So just about anything as I call mass. Mass walls are made for massive items. And uh, any other walls that says that have a heat capacity of uh, less than or greater than 6 BTUs uh, per square, uh, the square footage at 0 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe that is. So some of the provisions are assumed that the, uh, the, the mass wall is always above grade. Remember that? The idea that it gathers the heat from the, uh, the solar gain, the solar heat heats up the mass wall and then it's transferred. So obviously it would be no good if it was below grade. So here's a little thing that's explained better in this new IECC on the mass wall requirements. And they finally came to the point that uh, uh, the, the thermally massive walls lose a lot of their advantage when you insulate the building from them. So it's much better from an energy, stand, energy standpoint to have insulation on the outside of a thermally massive wall than it is to happen on the inside. And if you have uh, m most of the insulation on the inside, you have to have a little more of it. So that's why they give this over in the right hand column these d different numbers here uh, depending on whether it's uh, insulated on the inside or the outside and that's that's why those differences are there. So the second, the higher number applies when more than half of the R value is on the interior mass uh, for example, when the thermal mass is insulated again from the condition space. And here's a little bit about walls with partial structural sheathing. And if the structural sheathing covers uh, less than or, or equal to 40% of the gross wall area, then the continuous insulation R value can be reduced enough to result in a consistent total sheathing thickness, but not more than R3 on areas of walls covered by structural sheathing. So the, the, uh, the these are permitted uh, in areas that less than 60% has the full required insulated sheathing R value for, for one, or the 40% has a sandwich structural and insulated sheathing with th some thicknesses equal to that of the full insulated sheathing. And uh, you'll have to read through these caveats and look here on 402.2.7, but that's pretty much how it reads. And also, just one thing, provided that the R value of the insulating sheathing sandwiched over the structural sheathing is not reduced by any more than R3 compared to the full thickness insulated sheathing. Here we're going to move in a little bit more to the to floors now. This last uh, little, getting close to the last section as far as building envelope. 
so here's again the different uh, requirements for the floors over a condition of space and we see that R30 uh, is required for our area for uh, 5 and Marine 4 so just to re revisit this R19 fits in an 8 inch framing member but R30 requires a 10 inch framing member so what, what would uh, again you can't compress the insulation for a different item but let's see what happens if uh, what different caveats are there are or exceptions for framing that is less than the than a 2 by 10 let's say so here it is they tell you if the framing members are too small to accommodate R30 they will allow you to use R13 but not let R19 rather but not less than that uh, of course you'd have to check with your local code to see if that's acceptable as well especially with the stretch code but that's what there is allowable by the IECC remember the local codes always uh, always supersede anything that is in the IECC especially if they're more stringent that's the key always with that so here's what it looks like in unconditioned crawl space uh, perspective we're looking in the uh, at the crawl space you can see that that would be considered a vented crawl space by the by the those perforations in the in the wall there the the, the cinder block wall uh, concrete masonry units so what they're trying to say here is it, as it says on the lower right below the picture insulation must maintain permanent contact with the underside of the subfloor well they're not allowing you to hang the insulation down now let's say you have two by twelves and that R30, well, you know, you, it, it can't, it, that would leave two inches of space above the R30, at least. And they don't want that air space above. So they must, you must be contacting, your insulation must be pushed up, not compressed, but pushed up to, uh, to the underside of the subfloor. And, of course, then you sh they say some sort of system must hold it in place. Uh, there are some uh, systems with the plastic trays, but they usually span across the bottom of the joist you might have to have a little creativity here the other idea too though is they also want a complete system so that the insulation isn't sagging and hanging down like it happened like what happens in many crawl spaces over time uh, so there's got to be some way to keep that insulation up there and well that leaves an opening for somebody to invent another add-on to building another type of building thing that can be uh, you know supply that can be used that could do this so how about steel frame floors? Uh, they're treated in this table, uh, the 402.2.6. Uh, they always remind you that, the, that there's a lot more. You may have some different R values, and the reason is because, because of the steel metal. Or metal framing is a, it provides a more effective path for heat transmission than wood. Uh, it's wood stud construction. So again, it's the X plus Y. Uh, the R X cavity insulation plus the Y continuous insulation and for example the R26 plus 5 that's why you see that there in the uh, to the right on the on the floor joist it gives you some little different options there and pretty much lays it out for the different types of floor joists what you exactly have to do so steel frame floors again uh, uh, the then the table keys on the wood frame requirement for the corresponding building component so uh, you see that on the left for some reason they put the wood frame component right there so you can see how it differs or how it matches up to the steel uh, the steel floor and that's that that's why that category is there for the steel cold form steel type floor joist system if you're using that so defining below grade walls this is the same as of the 2009 the, the the idea is 50% or or less of a wall being below grade is called a below grade and treated that way, which is differently than of the 50% and above, which is an above grade foundation, which is also treated in a different manner, and that that's why you have to know which uh, decide which one it is. Uh, of course, you have to use uh, measurements. It's not something you can just arbitrarily decide. The uh, as it shows here in the picture. It gets a little sticky when you have a, uh, a graded type, a, grade, a gradient uh, to the a sloping grade as uh, alongside the building. 
but uh, you have to do the measurements and come up with what is the fifth, what amount are you 50% or more above or below. I always laugh because a 50% item is, uh, there's no demarcation there, so I guess, I guess if it comes out exactly to 50%, you decide. Uh, so either way, you have to f define whether you have an above grade or below grade wall all done by the measuring of the exterior surface and coming up with that calculation. So like it says here, uh, below grade walls, uh, and if not, of course, uh, that's the amount below or equal to 50%. Actually, they put the equal sign in here. So otherwise it's treated, and then, then they say otherwise treated as above grade wall. And let's see, for our climate zones, it would be 15 slash 19. Uh, that again, I believe you, there you have to. It's funny because you have to do some math sometimes. 15 would be cavity insulation, and the 19 would be the uh, total. So the exterior would have to have a four uh, R4 type uh, uh, cladding, or you, of course, you usually use the insulation, the rigid foam there. So that's where that rigid foam would be the, the four, number four value. And if they were below grade walls again, you have the, again, the numbers with the, you see there for, uh, for our area, 5 and Marine 4, the 15, 19. So the, uh, the let's use the 5, 13 for an example. The, the 5 would be continuous. Again, typically the foam board mounted on the foundation wall. And the 13 refers to the cavity. And to say, just to say better, no, true, there's no, there are no cavities on concrete walls. They're assuming that you're going to build a uh, a wood framed wall on the inner side uh, of the uh, on the inside side the interior of the uh, foundation wall and then you're going to use that cavity that's what they mean by the cavity just to explain that better and you it then pretty much insulated conventionally uh, but here's the five the five thirteen uh, and it should otherwise be let's see five thirteen uh, there should be a footnote right there on that table. If you go to that page, I can see it in the subscript on the, at least in the climate zone three category. You might want to look at that. But uh, in our area, it's it's considered fifteen nineteen. So you would have to use fifteen on the cavity on the inside, and have uh, a, a, something that achieves a value of four, the foam insulation on the exterior of the foundation. Uh, you might want to look into the concrete itself, what type of R rating it has. Uh, our concrete actually has pretty good R ratings for the thickness. So if you have a thick uh, wall there, you might be, you might have to end up putting like an R3 on the outside. You might achieve a value of one just for the concrete foundation itself. So again, here's the uh, insulation and the X plus Y. Let's look at the 519 uh, requirement. 1519, I mean, uh, in our zone 5. And it can be met with, as it says, the R13 cavity interior plus R5 continuous. That only equals 18, so I think they're assuming right there the value of 1 for the concrete wall itself. So more about the building envelope. Uh, what it, uh, We're going to we'll now go to the slabs area and take a look a little bit about what's needed and required there. So here's a little bit about slab edge insulation as it's called here and that's in the same section of uh, that we've been studying the for R402.2.10 that's the, the at least it's a little bit different section but right there in chapter 4 so the slab edge, uh, slab edge insulation may be installed vertically or horizontally as you can see by the figures on the right and on the inside or outside of the foundation walls you're given a few different options there yeah, but if installed vertically it must extend downward from the top of the slab to the uh, floor, to, to to the top of the footing, you can see that's in both cases, in Figure Two and Figure Three. Uh, you'd say, who would want to put the insulation on the inside? It seems a little bit odd and counterintuitive. Leaves a gap between the uh, of only styrofoam between the slab and the footing. I think the more conventional way is in Figure uh, Figure Two up above on the very top. Uh, the only thing here that looks a little different is. That the insulation extends uh, to above the uh, where the uh, top where the plate the the sole meets the top of the foundation, and he actually makes it all the way up to the uh, to the in uh, to the flashing, 
in that area and then they show it angled I guess for water runoff uh, that would that being exposed you'd have to put something else over that but we've seen there's some some of those foam, uh, foam foundation sheets are covered with a to make uh, to make them look like a actually like a wall, uh, wall or a masonry item they may have pea gravel attached to them and you might have to use a decorative one like that some of it of course would be buried as it shows because it's got to go to make it to the top of the footing in that case where a slab is being used so that's the detail and what it looks like um, the then the, you do have that odd one on the bottom the, the horizontal idea uh, and where you see that it, it does a little bit of a L-shaped type of uh, piece of insulation uh, that one seems to be even more complicated but you have that option as following that detail as it shows and let's see ex exactly for zone four and five but it must extend downward from the top of a, the slab as measured to a minimum of 24 inches for the zones for zones five at least four and five so that gives you an idea of uh, what you're up against luckily uh, as you see it goes up dramatically if you're in zone six so luckily uh, we don't have to worry about that too much Here's another detail. Here's uh, when it's placed on the inside. Of course, you see that bevel cut. So that 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 idea. I always think the slab is a little. Th it comes to a point there. It's really thin and seems to me to be a problem for uh, for water infiltration. If you, but uh, it's another detail, another way of doing things. This was the same in the uh, 2009. All this on the slab edge foam. Uh, uh, foam type insulation and these details were shown but uh, if you're new to it in this uh, 2015 it, it's, it's carried over and uh, again this is an idea of what it would look like in the field so a little bit more let's go to the crawl spaces that will finally end off the, the the building envelope idea and we'll, uh, we'll be able to move on to other things So here it is laid out for you, the differences between vented and unvented crawl spaces. Uh, not all of these items come from the IECC. A few of them come from the IRC, like the ventilation openings we'll talk about here in the list of vented crawl space requirements. And those ventilation openings have to be equal to at least one square foot for each 150 square feet of crawl space area, meaning the, the, the figuring out as a floor type uh, calculation, floor space, not the exterior walls uh, calculation, and must be placed to provide cross flow, so you can't just have the, all those ventilation openings on one wall. Uh, a vapor retarded may be uh, required as part of the floor assembly, but that says may be required. And the, the last thing about the ducts and the crawl space must be sealed and have R6 when you're a vented crawl space. Because there's a lot of, you're having all that outside air, it's basically the temperature of the crawl space when it's vented is going to be pretty much equal to the ambient outside temperature. Now, unvented crawl spaces are more like part of your basement. So the but here the uh, the at any rate the crawl space ground that dirt floor must be covered with an approved vapor retarder or plastic it's or for example a plastic sheathing. Think of it as a pool liner that goes right there on the dirt. And the, uh, the the makes it great and nice and clean down there, and uh, the, the that's one great thing if you're doing work afterwards because there's nothing probably nastier than the crawl spaces. Uh, the one thing about this too, though, is uh, it really sp stops the amount of moisture. Then that was the biggest problem with crawl spaces: moisture tr being transferred into the home. Uh, that's probably that's why on the left, even the vented one, you may have to depending on your, your your local codes or whatever that you may have to put it even so j uh, some type of barrier or moisture barrier uh, on the floor but anyway the crawl space uh, let's get back to the chart on the right and the crawl space must be insulated to the R value again in the requirements with uh, with the table 401.2.2 and the crawl sta space insulation must extend from the top of the wall to the inside finished grade and then 24 inches vertically or horizontally so think of that uh, that's the insulation itself so you see how that has to wrap around 
and uh, but it's definitely there on the uh, to insulate the walls uh, in the vertical type fashion, and then it runs across the top of the inside finished grade as it says. So that would be the uh, the the floor of the crawl space, the dirt floor. So moving ahead here, the crawl spaces must be mechanically vented in that case. So there has to be some still some form of exhausting air. It tells you uh, the amount there. That's more from the IRC, I believe, that the exhaust per 50 square feet, um, one CFM per 50 square feet of conditioned uh, space, and heated and cooled as part of the building envelope. So the, you are actually going to have a duct down into the crawl space. That's why it says it's, it's a heated or cooled space, just like a basement is. It might be a little colder than the rest of the house, uh, figuring it on its own, but it's going to have to have uh, ducting down there that actually transfers air from the HVAC system or the heating system right there into the uh, crawl space. So it says ducts are inside conditioned space and therefore don't need to be insulated. That's if your duct work that happens to run to any of those registers uh, or any of the, you know any of those uh, any of the way that you're transferring the air into the into there, or if you just happen to be into the crawl space, or if you just happen to be running ducts uh, for some reason through the crawl space for ease, they they just simply don't have to be insulated. So here's a little bit on U factor and total UA alternatives, just to get uh, get aside from or, or into a new area. What is a U factor alternative? Well, it's similar to prescriptive R value but uses U factors instead. And it allows for an innovative or less common construction techniques that are such as structural insulated panels, SIPs, or advanced framing, but allows no trade-offs between building components. And then you have this other item called the Total UA Alternative. It's pretty much the same as U factor alternative, but it does allow trade-offs across all envelope components, and it's the primary approach that's used in the res check soft area and it shows UA minus U factor times the area of assembly it's so it's a calculation done on a, uh, a type of algorithm that's within the software itself so here's a table right from the IECC uh, now that the table applies to assemblies whereas the previous R value tables apply to insulation only so note that the uh, frame U factors have changed from the 2012 uh, IECC and uh, certainly from the 2009 IECC. <clears throat> so a little bit about mass walls. The this is how looking at it from the the U factor type chart. Uh, this chart again is found. Uh, it's it's still in the same section. Uh, the, the table is 402.1.4 just to say and the second U factor in the table is for interior and insulated walls so there's the difference uh, provisions listed here apply when heat capacity is a less than or equal to 6 BTU per square foot and where more than half the insulation is on the interior or the mass wall U factors are uh, those are the two different provisions So here are some of the fenestration trade-off limits when using the, again, the hard limits on the U-factor in the northern U.S. cannot be exceeded, though, even in trade-offs. So that's uh, those are those hard limits, as we call it, uh, that we talked about previously. So in our climate zone 4 to 5, you have the U-factor. Well, actually, climate zone 5, we are uh, the U-factor minimum or maximum, so, excuse me, is 0.48. And... The same goes for our area for for U uh, for zones five continue for skylights would be a U factor of 0.75, and U factors of individual windows of skylights can be higher if maximum area weighted average is used below uh, below these limits. Remember the uh, the weighted average of fig figuring all your fenestration, so you could have uh, individually for each window you could have a little different item. 
a little bit more on the trade-off limits, a hard limit on solar heat gain coefficient. This is uh, only zones one through three. Just the uh, they they it's not advantageous to them. The solar heat gain is a problem for them, but for up here we don't consider this poor part of the uh, the, the code at all. So sunrooms just all together, same as back in the old IECCs. They are allowed to be treated differently. They have less stringent insulation R value and glazing U factor requirements. Then it goes on to exactly define what a sunroom is, about being a one-story uh, structure and less than 40% of the glazing with the exterior wall and roof area. You have to fit into all those caveats to be a sunroom. And for that, at least one thing, uh, you look up, if you look up the sunrooms all together, you see like the wall insulation is a much lower number. We'll go with the, into that a little bit in the next slide. So here it is right here for uh, zones 5 through 8. The ceiling could be 24 on a sunroom. The wall insulation, R13, uh, much different. The fenestration factors and skylight factors are, are different as well. Uh, I would argue that most people in the, in the northern climate do, do not even use the sunrooms at all. And, and now it, you notice this one portion of the, uh, of the one port of part of the code that wasn't mentioned. But you see on the drawing there, and it says thermal isolated, thermally isolated. They're assuming that a sunroom is built onto a conventional exterior of a building and that you have your regular exterior wall insulation between the sunroom and the house. Uh, and that goes for between the basement and the house if it figures into this type of configuration. So the idea is that you could do all these lower insulation factors for a sunroom but it must be thermally isolated from the home. The home, it cannot be, uh, it could never be open to the home in any way, and that means having, a, if you have a door to get out to that, it has to be, uh, or let's say a slider door like some people do, then it has to be fit into those tables for U factors and SHGC pretty much the same way, and uh, the R values are all figured the same way. So think of it as a standalone system as far as the sunroom is. Okay, here is a little bit on the simulated performance alternative and it says proposed design to be shown to have an annual energy cost uh, that is less than or equal to the annual energy cost of the standard reference design and that's what the simulated performance alternative uh, is and the specifications for the standard reference and proposed design are found in this table R504.5 which I believe is uh, is one of those one of those, one, it, this is new in the chapter I think uh, it'll be a good item to look up and just double check on so the simulated the simulated performance alternatives can be used for building design that do not comply with all the prescriptive requirements in chapter 4 of the IECC and under the simulated performance alternative, a proposed uh, design will comply with the code if the calculated annual energy cost is not greater than a similar building with the standard design de designed in accordance with Chapter 4. And the proposed design uses the same energy sources, floor area, geometry, design conditions, occupancy, climate data and usage schedules in the standard design. Some energy conserving strategies to improve the performance of the proposed design include exterior shading of windows, passive solar design, thermal mass heat storage, improved thermal envelope, improved duct systems, and reduced air infiltration, and high efficiency heating, cooling, and water and heating equipment. Now, what it really is is Within all these software programs, there is a there is a design base that's meant for a like home. So when you plug in all the information uh, of the the house that you're building, it will automatically compare that to what's what's the basement design uh, that's within the within the software that sets the standards for the for the minimum the baseline. And you when you pr your design needs to be above and beyond that. So 
the uh, to be, uh, at least to be a high performance home and um, of course if you fall below the level of the what's within the software for the the design baseline uh, well that raises all the red flags and you simply uh, don't don't pass as far as being an energy efficient uh, type home at all without at any reading so a little bit about the energy rating index uh, it, it requires that mandatory provisions are met that's the very first thing and the building thermal envelope shall be greater than or equal to the levels of efficiency and SHGC in the tables as written and even in the uh, the tables are written the 2009 IECC. One exception is supply and return decks are not completely inside the building thermal envelope but they should be insulated to a minimum of R6 uh, and compliance with this method must be completed by an approved third party and document uh, documenting person including compliance reports which must be reviewed by the code official so compliance is demonstrated if the calculated ERI is uh, greater than or equal to a defined threshold for the zone in which the building is located. And here are some of the ERI indexes that are given. Again, this is all figured by a computer software program. It's kind of like the Energy Star item, where if you've ever done that, where you you figure the uh, you end up getting a number of that everything is translated into a number for your overall efficiency of the building, kind of like a score. You can call it a scorecard. So again, back to the on the rating index, uh, it, it's defined much like the ResNut HERS index uh, about these values. It's an in integer value, so uh, 100 co corresponds to an ERI reference design. Reference design is one of those that are in the software that I was saying, the baseline type design. And zero co corresponds to a net zero energy home. So, the, if you got a score of, uh, well, of course, if it went in of 100, then you're just right at the baseline. There's not you're at that that what's within the software, and that that's really the minimum. So here, each integer value represents a one percent change. So there's your percentage amount. So if you have a, a score of 50, uh, 60, let's say, you are actually looking at a 40 percent change from reference design. And the ERI does uh, differ from the traditional performance path since the ERI considers all energy used in the residence and whereas a performance path only includes heating, cooling, lighting, uh, and water heating. And the reason for that, again, is done on a software program. Even the windows, the U-factors, the SHGC, the wall insulation, all that's figured in when doing an energy rating index. I'd say it's more comprehensive and you can see by the what's written here that it is. So one last thing here, a couple things. The equipment and appliance, appliance efficiencies can also be involved in the uh, trade-offs. Remember the appliance efficiencies, I don't believe there are, uh, there, there are no trade-offs in the uh, in other forms or pathways that may follow for compliance. And the credit towards compliance may be available for renewable energy. So if you, I believe if you're using, uh, you, you get some credits if you are using renewable energy. Um, again, that's done in a more comprehensive way, something like LEED design does, uh, the USGBC with the LEED and energy and uh, effic uh, efficiency design. So some of the mandatory requirements here, the, here's section 402.4, mandatory again, the air leakage. Another item altogether, uh, this is pretty much the same as in the previous versions of this code. Uh, we pretty much know this. You have to seal all these different penetrations. Uh, fireplaces are interesting because you, the fireplace itself, if you look at the IRC, uh, the door itself has to be an insulated type door. Uh, obviously we're not using the fireplace so you're not uh, getting any drafting into the home that way. Uh, the ch but the also and all the area around the, the chimneys and so on and so forth, and uh, all these areas that are pretty much written there down on the right hand co uh, corner of there of the of the slide that have all the different assemblies just gives you an idea of what they're talking about where the air uh, air leakage occurs and 
therefore should be uh, closed up. Looking at this a little bit closer, this is using the different type of insulating caulking or uh, the foam that comes in in a uh, you know in a can that you do all you you do the all the insulating around the piping as on the top right that anything that extends especially through the exterior walls you can see down below it the electrical box all sealed around it uh, the windows and doors but also all these different penetrations that occur around the equipment uh, everything gets sealed off. Uh, pretty well and that that's one of the most inspected items going on out there in building. So here about the building thermal envelope a little bit more the uh, you have two options here now that that's the, of at least of complying with the to look for air leakage uh, and that's the basic blower door test the whole pressure whole house pressure test as they call it here uh, that that's tested at if you look at the far left that's less than or equal to 5 ACH well that's air changes per hour so that's that that in the top though is only for climate zones one and two in climate zone five here it would be less than or equal to uh, three air changes per hour at 50 pascals and that's just how the test is done so you can you can lose the volume of air three times over over a certain period of time uh, to, be, to, to be able to achieve uh, to pass the test lower you, you have to have lower than the three air changes per hour you cannot exceed that here again is another little handy table this table is great for for giving a quick breakdown is found uh, there 402.4.1.1 has all the different criteria uh, it's a handy it's really a good checklist I, that's how I've liked to use it in the past, and it's it tells you exactly what has to be done for each uh, assembly. Uh, that's only part of the table. It even goes right on down to the duct requirements down near the bottom. So this this is one handy one to keep around. Here's about the fireplaces. So the new wood burning fireplaces shall have a tight fitting flue dampers and doors. So that's what I was talking about a few minutes ago, and uh. The reason for that, again, is just that you're not getting any backflow of air into the home. Uh, drafts, just simple drafts of cold air. Uh, you have these different tight-fitting doors on the fireplaces that are labeled by UL, the Underwriters Laboratories. They are the reference standard for that. And uh, so they have to have been achieved a factory-tested type rating um, or fa uh, a tested rating even for the factory bill. And if you have the masonry built, if it's your building in place, they have to also uh, be they have to be labeled, listed and labeled per UL 907. A little bit different reference standard on that same company underwriters laboratories. A little bit about fenestration air leakage. Look at this on the doors, windows, and skylights. Those are measured up close. Those are maximums for those type of assemblies. We know you're going to lose, no matter what. You you cannot make the the you cannot get 100% uh, non-infiltration of air. That's why they have the blower test. Uh, the doors themselves, and the, now think about this, the doors and the windows themselves, windows never close 100% tight. There's always, just in the manufacture of the windows themselves, this has nothing to do with your installation. It has to do with the window itself, there's some airflow through them, if, especially when there's a pressure gradient, a, a pressure differential, on one side of the window to the other, and that's what the blower door test does by creating a different, uh, a different, a differential of air, uh, air pressure. Then you get to see the inflow or outflow of or the drafting effect. Well, that happens normally too. Uh, differentials like that, anyway, uh, within homes and the exterior environment. So there's always a passage. Of never, never mind the high winds uh, add on to the effect as 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 it is too. Uh, bouncing into the home of the windows so they the, again this is the amounts that they're allowed uh, you should be able to know from cut sheets what uh, type of air infiltration you could expect with a window or door one could be defective you never know that's why it's tested one could have been racked or somehow damaged during uh, during transport or installation that might be a reason and that's why all these items are checked individually 
So here are some restrictions here with the encode different items about the rooms with fuel burning burning appliances, the same section. This uh, applies to our climate zone. The open combustion fuel burning appliances were open. Combustion air ducts provide combustion air. And you have these different items you have to follow. The appliances and combustion air opening shall be located outside the building thermal envelope or enclosed in a room isolated from the inside thermal envelope and sealed and insulated per the table, 402.1.2. The doors still need to be gasketed and sealed. And any ducts or water lines that have to do with the appliance have to be insulated for per R403. Now, let's say the, uh, the, the water line, that would be uh, R3, I believe, for a, for a water line, if it happened to be that. And you, this would, let's say, a, com a combustion bur fuel burning appliance. Uh, appliances are the terminology that they always use in the code here, just to begin with that. The, uh, the, it could mean a wa hot water heater. Uh, that's an appliance. It's not appliances in the conventional manner that we think of in normal, in normal talk about in, uh, the appliances within a kitchen, nothing to do with it at all. Matter of fact, appliances are actually defined differently in the definitions section as any energy burning device. So it could be use electricity, it could use fuel, gas, uh, could use oil, oil fired. Although any type of energy that's being tra uh, trans uh, transmitted there into the into uh, the heating or cooling of air, at least or water is definitely an appliance. So a little bit more here, combustion air ducts uh, must be insulated to R uh, uh, less than R or uh, greater than R8 when it passes through a conditioned space as you see here. Uh, and there are some exceptions where a direct vent appliance with both intake and exhaust pipes are installed continuous to the outside and fireplaces and sto uh, stoves complying with this R402.4.2 in the uh, in the section and section R1006 of the IRC, so that would be chapter chapter 10 there, where you would find that. Recess lighting fixtures, well, they're, they're pretty much the same as the previous codes. Uh, again, they need to be an IC rated type, which is uh, the reason for the IC rating. It's Remember that the uh, it means insulated insulation contact. So the uh, the what happened is during one point of time the, the can lighting or recess lighting was the insulation would push up against it and with a conventional bulb that gets the the fixture got hot it could burn the insulation causing a fire. So that's why the uh, insulation contact type uh, idea came in so that insulation can be pushed up tight to it. And that that way you have a good you have this totally insulated. But not only that, the fixture itself it, it does not allow the so much for the passage of air. The old fixtures used to have a ton of holes in them. Uh, it, you could feel the wind air blowing right through them uh, when there was a definite preferred differential. And sometimes these were placed in a, uh, between the attic and the living space. Uh, you could uh, the second floor areas uh, so you were having a lot of movement of air between the attic space and the uh, and the building uh, the, the the room down below uh, to the point now that they make you actually caulk with you have to either use a gasket or caulking around the housing that go be between the housing and the drywall so they, they need to be super tight and uh, that's the idea but that's been around for a while so a little bit on mechanical systems next and uh, the the equipment efficiency, just to say, is set by federal law and not the I codes. Some again mandatory requirements for systems as far as mechanical goes. The controls are mandatory. The heat pump supplementary heat mandatory. Hot water boiler, outdoor temperature setback mandatory. Ducts sealing is mandatory, and insulation is prescriptive. Uh, so there are the two different ways of looking at it. Seal, duct sealing altogether, uh, we'll go into that in a few more moments. Uh, however, you, just to say that all ducts have to be pressurized and pass a test, kind of like the uh, blower door test, let's say, and that way to see what the kind of leakage you're getting through the duct work. And if that doesn't pass, then you have to 
of course do go back and do some more resealing of the ducts it means of course the uh, in all the uh, connections is where the, the biggest loss is uh, so then we have the HVAC piping insulation that has to be done that's one thing on the exterior of the home too there's a whole system uh, item on that hot water systems uh, the piping it's actually listed from three different areas about the uh, piping uh, itself to the let's just say to the fixtures in the kitchen has to be insulated with R3 from the hot water heater to the uh, to the fixtures so hot water systems uh, altogether ventilation and dampers are mandatory have mandatory treatments uh, we have a, a mandatory item about equipment sizing about systems serving multiple dwelling units snow melt controls there's a little bit of just a little bit about that but the uh, if you have snow melt on your roof line some people actually have it in the walkways and then the last item here pools and in-ground permanently installed spas also have some mandatory systems requirements that will go into each category a little bit more in depth so one thing about the controls here's a pro programmable thermostat and at least one programmable thermostat controlling the primary heating and cooling for the dwelling unit is the, uh, the, the, the item that's mandatory here uh, the capability though to set back the temporary or temporarily operate the system in zones as you can see by down to 55 degrees uh, or up to 85 degrees that's so you can program each zone and keep it separate from the other uh, that helps uh, zones are usually sometimes done on a room by room basis so it should be initially programmed by the manufacturer with the heating temperature set point no higher than 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the cooling temperature set back no low, lower than 78 degrees Fahrenheit so, okay the idea of this rule here is comes from the stems from the idea that heat pumps have having supplementary electric resistance heat uh, need to have controls that, uh, uh, the, except during defrost and prevent supplemental heat operate what they do is prevent supplemental heat operation when the heat pump compressor can meet the heating load about the hot water system one or two pipe heating systems have an outdoor setback control to lower boiler temperature based on the outside temperature so they're actually sensing what's going on with the outside temperature and of course the the the, the system calibrates accordingly or adjusts accordingly so it might be worth uh, noting that the code doesn't say how the boiler set point varies with the outside temperature just that it does so without knowing how much there's a little idea of how do you really make this uh, adjustment factor and uh, but the point of the code is that the boiler set point must be controlled in response to outdoor temperature that's the point so duct insulation uh, the supply ducts it's Here's, here's the different amounts. Uh, depends on location, as you see. That you have the, uh, the 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 R8 is greater than when the duct is greater than or equal to three inches in diameter, and it can be R6 if less than three inches. So you can pretty much use this char uh, the chart to give an idea of exactly what where for every type of uh, duct to work where where it goes and what area it goes through for what space it you know and as it changes accordingly uh, at least you you can check that your duct work is correct this way so just one thing no trade-offs are allowed for duct insulation uh, one exception is that ducts must be completely inside the building envelope for uh, that's the building envelope meaning nothing outside of the building as far as going through conditioned or unconditioned spaces that's a, that's a different item altogether and if you see the NR here on the chart, it always means it's uh, not required or there is no requirement there. So duct sealing, though, is mandatory. I touched on that a moment ago. And that includes all ducts, air handlers, and filter boxes need to be sealed as well. The, uh, there are some exceptions. It's, like it says, for uh, joint seals required for air impermeable spray foam products, so you have no additional joint seals there. Now there is a thing for if if you cannot reach into a certain type of area to uh, to seal a uh, to seal a duct, uh, there was an idea that you could use these continuously welded and locking top type joints, 
and seams, but other than the snap lock and button lock types, and where they have static pressures of less than two inches in the water column pressure classification, uh, don't require additional closure systems. So duct testing, there it is, the rough in, you can do it at rough in, and you have that, uh, that amount given that you have one inch uh, in the water uh, at 25 pascals across the system, of course, uh, including manufacturer's air enclosure, air handler enclosure, and the, basically, all you, what you gotta, that's done when all reg ta registers are taped or otherwise sealed, of course, uh, to, to create that pressurization within the ductwork. Now, you could do a post-construction test as well, or, or just in accord, uh, indifference to the rough-end test. Of course, the rough-end test is better because if, you have any, if you're using any type of drywall enclosures around this and you find out that you're not meeting the leakage standards, then you're going to have to be, do some ripping apart of different assemblies just to get to possibly test where a, a, a leak may be happening. So, but you do have the option of a post-construction test. And again, the same thing, the registers have to be taped and sealed. Now, there is one exception, and that's where duct, the duct air leakage test is not required where ducts and air handlers are in, entirely within the building thermal envelope. So that that's... Uh, that's one little thing you can look at. You can design your system accordingly. Uh, and that may make a little bit of a distant difference uh, in the total testing. The output is a written report of results of the test signed by the third. It's actually a third party, or it says the party conducting the test. I think the reason is that you can, you know, it is a third party, but unless the HVAC people were working directly for you, it's usually done by a uh, HVAC professional that that runs this type of test can be do by, done by a third party rater as well. A little bit about the dust le duct leakage too, the, the looking at the prescriptive method. So the total leakage of ducts uh, shall be in accordance with section 403.3.3. .3. It shall be as uh, done as follows with the total leakage of less than or equal to 4 cubic feet per minute per 100 f uh, square feet of conditioned floor area. And that's if the air handle is not installed at the time of the test and the total air leakage is less than or equal to 3 CFM per 100 feet squared. The post construction tra uh, treated a little bit differently. You can see the total leakage uh, is the same as in the rough end test and that's about that's the most important point there. Here's just a look at some of the tightness tests and how they're done in the field, how they're performed. Let's just say that these air handlers they're, they're figured on a design type item. They must have a, de a manufacturer's de designation for an air leakage of less than or equal to 2% of design airflow rate. And that's per that standard ASHRAE, American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers. So um, just to say it's a different reference standard there. One thing that's always been out you can't uh, from even the previous codes, you cannot use framing cavities for ducts of plenums. So no running, you no running of the return air through between the between the studs of an interior wall. That's that all that has been out for a long time. So mechanical piping insulation. This is where the R3 is required on HVAC systems, uh, and that's uh, uh, the exception there is for piping that conveys fluids between 55 degrees and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if exposed to weather, and they tell you this, this is why you have to put insulation. They must protect from damage but also including sunlight, moisture, equipment, maintenance, and wind. So the old shielding used to say they put the foam around the uh, pipes outside to the in, to the to where it entered the building and we'll put some uh, plastic tape. That's out. That's not, no longer allowed. The, these, uh, the, the, the idea is to protect in all these different manners. And you must uh, provide shielding from solar radiation, uh, which, you know, it, with a material that doesn't degrade because of solar. And there it is there, the adhesive tape is no longer allowed. Actually, it wasn't even adhesive, it was just a regular tape. So the uh, service hot water systems, uh, uh, here, is a, the, the, here is where you have some requirements. We'll take a look at the next page, but let's say we're, we're going to look at uh, heated water circulation systems, heat tray systems, and demand recirculation systems. So a heat water re, uh, circulation system must be provided with the circulation pump. The return pipe must be a dedicated return pipe or a cold water supply pipe. 
and the gravity and thermal siphon circulation systems are prohibited. So the controls need to start the pump based on the identification of the demand for hot water. Uh, good fits to the idea of hot water on demand, or and with the the, the obviously calibrated or uh, figured to be able to serve the occupancy. The automatically turn off uh, the pump water when the water is in the loop, and as at the desired temperature, and there's no demand for hot water, so the pumps automatically turn off and don't keep running. Uh, goes without saying, the automatic controls, temperature sensors, and pumps shall be accessible, and the manual controls shall be readily accessible as well. So, a little bit about the heat trace system here. Electric heat trace systems must comply with uh, the IEEE 515, that's the International Electrical Engineers, uh, I forget the last bit of the acronym, or the UL, uh, United Underwriters Laboratories 515. And the controls shall have automatic, uh, shall automatically adjust the energy input to the heat tracing to maintain the desired water temperature in the piping in accordance with the times when heated water is used in the occupancy. So, demand recirculation systems. This is the third type. There are systems having one or less or equal to uh, less than or equal to one, or excuse me, more than or equal to one. Oh. Here are some requirements for hot water pipe insulation, and what's changed here is that R3 is now required on th uh, three quarter inch and above, including the three quarter inch. Before, it used to read piping greater than three quarter inch. Now it's greater than or equal to a little thing that could be easily missed. And the same old uh, other type of items are in the piping serving more than one dwelling unit uh, needs to be insulated. The piping located outside the conditioned space needs to be insulated. Piping from the hot wa uh, the water heater to a distribution manifold needs to be insulated and piping under a floor slab or buried piping or supply and return piping and recirculating systems other than demand circulation systems. A little bit of uh, requirements here about the mechanical ventilation and the building to have one ventilation meeting IRC or IMC, the International Mechanical Code or the International Residential Code or other approved means and the outdoor intakes and exhaust shall have automatic or gravity dampers that will close when the ventilation system is not operating otherwise the efficacy table needs to be met in uh, that 403.6.1 and that is in the IECC so going back to the other the top one you have to refer to other, man, uh, other manuals or other books to get some of the to get some idea of other requirements so it's not everything is in the IECC and of course there's a one exception where fans are integral to tested and listed HVAC equipment they shall be powered by an electronically commutated motor here's a bit about drinking water heat recovery units if you're not familiar with them there these units are actually uh, right down in the drain siphon or the uh, right below the drain shower drain think of they they recover they they actually recover heat from the uh, from the from what's going down the drain from being used in a shower let's say of course they're a lot more efficient when they're used in a or let's say they work they work um, a little bit better when there's more than one shower and you have a you know an amount of heat recovery that's a little bit more than a residential one-off system but at any rate. The, uh, again, like in, let's say, a shower in a gymnasium where you have quite a few showers running at the same time. But they have to be complied with the CSA B55.2 and tested in accordance with uh, CSA B55.1. And they have a little item that they say the portable water side pressure loss of drain water, hot recovery unit, heat recovery units, I should say, shall be less than 3 psi for individual units connected to one or two showers and less than two PFSI if connected to greater than three showers so it's this almost assumes that you have quite a few showers working and again you would apply this more in the commercial manner in my, in my estimation so a little bit about equipment sizing and it's a indirect is a direct reference to the IRC again going outside of the IECC because there's not much about equipment sizing in the IECC and the intent is to get the HVA system sized correctly so it operates as efficiently as possible. 
Uh, we know that oversized equipment has a higher initial cost, a higher operating co cost, may provide less comfort, and the the short cycling reduces the equipment life expectancy. So any one of these uh, is a good reason not to oversize. And heating and cooling system design loads for the purpose of sizing systems and equipment shall be determined in accordance with the procedures described in the ACCA Manual J or an equivalent computation procedure. So there's another thing going outside of the IECC. You see on these specific equipment pieces that are here at the end of the presentation that uh, that you you're having to go outside of the uh, outside of the IECC. Um, and now here's a uh, a little bit about the efficiency rating and you can find a good chart in the IBC that has quite a few of the efficiency rating ratings for different types of equipment. It's a whole section in there. All those SEER ratings for air, like air conditioning and heating systems uh, and tons of other equipment that you would need, uh, motors and different items. So you might want to go there to take a look in the IBC. Here's a little bit on snow melt system controls. Uh, the, we think of those mostly in the north. You think of them as being placed along the roof. They don't mention that here, but I'm pretty sure that the requirements go for for either in either direction here because they're talking about the snow melt systems that are basically placed on the pavement as it says that are used for walkways and and driveways and they tell you that the automatic shutoff uh, you must have an automatic shutoff when pavement temperature is greater than 50 degrees and no precipitation is falling so you need some sensors there and an automatic or manual shutoff when outdoor temperature is uh, greater than 40 degrees but it does make sense for an energy saving type idea. And here about pools and permanent spa energy consumption. Uh, altogether remember that the pools and spas are in accordance with APSP for 145. The heaters should be uh, ha equipped with a readily accessible on-off switch that is integral part of the heater or mounted on the exterior of heater or external to within three feet of heater. And that's so uh, that's been a requirement for a while allows the technicians and uh, for emergency shutoff, they used to be hardwired in the past. That's that rule's been around thing I think from 2009. So the switch shall not change the heating of the setting of the heater thermostat, so that people can't be changing that. And switches shall be in addition to the circuit breaker. Um, remember, if it's fired by natural gas, it's not allowed to have continuously burning lights, and that pretty much goes for pilots are out for all types of equipment. So time switches, uh, they have to be controlled automatically uh, if using the control method or any other control method if, you, uh, if either way turn off and on the heater and pumps according to a preset schedule installed on all heaters and pump motors so there are some exceptions if they're public health standards or the local codes that is requiring a 24-hour pump operation or uh, pumps that are operating pools with solar and waste heat recovery system sy uh, systems uh, the the solar system there is not like solar panels, PV panels that are photovoltaic, change, using uh, changing solar power to energy. They're the ones that are that use piping, uh, that pipe water through the solar panel and actually heat the water itself and just recirculate it into the pool. Here about covers, uh, you, this was old in 2009, they, the, but it just says they have to have. You have to have covers on heated pools and outdoor permanently installed spars. That is a vapor retardant cover or other approved vapor retardant means. In the past, it gave an R value for that. We don't have that anymore. And the exception is if uh, less than 70% is uh, of energy is recovered from site recovered energy on the site itself. Here about portable spas, energy consumption of electric powered portable spars shall be controlled by the requirements of APSP. 14 again going outside of the IECC for some rules here and actually even outside of the uh, the, the code books that are produced by the ICC. Systems, some general items that systems serving multiple dwelling units shall comply with section C403 and C404 which is a commercial section remember in lieu of this, uh, the residential section which is a little bit odd uh, that might include something like meeting and uh, metering and uh, the idea of having separate metering, remember it's multiple dwelling units, so it falls in a more of a commercial category. About the lighting equipment, but the 75% minimum, 
installed fixtures shall have high efficacy or efficiency lamps, or 75% of permanently installed lighting fixtures shall contain only high efficacy lamps. Only one exception, low voltage lighting. Okay, so here's about the fuel, fuel gas lighting systems can't have burning pilot lights. That pretty much uh, puts it out for anything for gas right there. There's the all-encompassing requirement, and that is mandatory. So this is the new chapter, existing buildings. What are covered, the additions, alterations, and repairs, existing buildings, maintenance even, compliance, new and replacement materials, and even buildings designated as historic if somebody wants to achieve the, uh, the, the, the standards set forth in the IECC, which they can opt out on generally as a historic building as well. So here are the uh, what, uh, thing about existing buildings, about meeting the prescriptive requirements in Table 402.1.2. So that's the table that you go to. Remember that uh, you, would, you would have to follow all these for R value and U value calculation. So you treat the addition, obviously, there on the right as a standalone building and ignore the common walls between the existing building and the addition. But you combine the existing building with the addition and bring the whole building into compliance is another path that you can follow. And compliance can be harder to achieve if the existing building is quite old, obviously. A little bit more on existing buildings, since it's all new here. The additions comply if any of the following is demonstrated. The addition alone complies with the provisions of the code, the existing building in addition together comply as a single building, or the existing building in addition together use no more energy than the existing building. So again, a bit on existing buildings about alterations. This is in that new section, R503. The code applies to any new construction and unaltered uh, portions that do not need to comply, of course. Here you have a little item just on the fenestration. That includes both glazing and sash. Both glazing and sash must meet. Let's see, for our, for the section here, it would be for uh, using U-factors and all. And I'm going to, they don't actually list five there, but I would guess it would be the .40 SHGC. Um, and maybe not. Maybe it's just all using U-factors. Let's say it's just using U-factors. That's the idea there. So the building envelope, uh, here are some exceptions. Uh, storm windows over existing fenestration, they're, they're exempted. Surface applied film uh, that's over in, in an existing plane, exposed existing ceiling or floor cavities if already filled with, in it with insulation. Uh, existing roof or walls that aren't exposed. Roof recovers uh, not, are accepted. And roofs without cavity insulation, neither sheathing uh, nor insulation exposed during the the re-roofing so that, that's it you're not disturbing anything then you you're okay insulate either above or below the sheathing as uh, the, the, as, as required here so for the lighting some of the exceptions if uh, less than 50 percent of the luminaires in the space are replaced and only bulbs and ballast within existing luminaires are replaced within uh, provided installed lighting power is increased of course. <clears throat> How about a bit about the existing buildings so the uh, new HVA systems and duct systems that are part of the alteration to comply with the section 403.1 or R 403.2, R 403.3 and R 403.6. One exception where duct from an existing HVAC system are extended duct systems within less than 40 linear feet in unconditioned spaces are not required to be tested in accordance with the R403.3.3. So that's less than 40 linear feet of ducting. And the service hall water systems, so the new systems uh, that are part of the alteration uh, to comply with 403.4. So this is all for the existing buildings, a little bit of the fudge factor there. So work on undamaged components necessary for the required repair or damaged components shall be considered part of the repair and are not subject to the alterations requirement. And some of the repairs that are considered part of the code, as you see, glass only replacements, roof repairs, and repairs where only one bulb of ballast within the existing luminaires in the space are replaced, provided the replacement does not increase the installed interior lighting power. So, with that, we conclude the presentation on code review. And just to say, take a look at the Massachusetts code books because 
some of those in the have come out with a late edition of the eighth edition that came out in September or late September 2016, and there are changes there that you would have to make uh, in the IECC. It's different than the the previous editions that were out. We have not yet trans uh, in Massachusetts not let ch not yet changed to the ninth ed. Uh, so I hope that you can use these IECC changes and code review as soon as possible since this is all going into effect in 2017 as far as the changes. So thank you.